Again, my name is Renee Sanders. Um, I, uh, I'm an educator. I taught here in the Philadelphia school system for about 15 years. Um, I also was the principal overseeing a small um, private day school here in Philadelphia. And then I also taught uh, for 11, 12 years in the Atlanta public school system. So teaching has been my profession. Uh, not only is it my profession, it's also in my family's profession. My brother taught here in Philadelphia. <laughs> my father taught here in Philadelphia. <laughs> and my mother, well, she, she had an education degree, but she never did teach. Uh, so it, this is in my blood. So again, um, giving out accurate information has always been something that has been very important to me. Uh, when I was teaching, I was, well, I taught several subjects, but music was one of my major subjects that I had to teach. And so again, it was always about teaching children the accurate history of what they're even listening to on the radio, giving them some background information so that they can understand and comprehend, you know, maybe even how music may even be utilized on them during some time during the daytime, you know. So again, these are the things that I always wanted to do. So passing out accurate information is very important to me. Okay, so with that, uh, let's, we'll, we'll begin. Now, the, uh, the images that are around the outside of this, uh, they're not very clear. Uh, some of the images are getting a little washed out. However, these are artifacts that have been found in the ground here in the United States. And the, uh, the ones on top, so this here, this one, and this one, both of them were found in the Cahokia Mounds, which is in uh, St. Louis, right outside of St. Louis. And, and the ones on the bottom, uh, they have come out of the, uh, mount, the Etowah Mounds in Georgia. Uh, the, the Cahokia Mounds, where these were found, has the largest mound here in the United States. Uh, the base of the mound is larger than the base of the, the largest pyramid in Giza. So we have a mound here in the United States whose base is larger than the Pyramid of Giza. How many people knew that? <laughs> I, and, and see, this is just the beginning, again, of the information that we do not know. And again, those are artifacts that were found in the ground there. All right, and we know that art reflects the people who create it. And so again, if we could see these images and where we could see that these images that are buried in the ground here in the United States are images of people of color, maybe we will begin to understand this history a little bit more. Brown skinned people from very light to the darkest of dark have existed in the Americas continuously for many thousands of years. Writer Jack Forbes in his book Africans and Native Americans said, many, but not all, Native Americans were brown or dark colored without African ancestry. These brown-skinned people lived here long before the dawn of European civilization and the arrival of the European settlers. When the Europeans arrived to the shores of the United States, they encountered a culture of people that became known as the Mound Builders. Mound Builder is a general term referring to the indigenous inhabitants of North America who built various styles of earthen mounds for burial, residential, and ceremonial purposes. Here you see a sampling of mound sites that have been discovered in the United States. These mounds are primarily visible from the Mississippi River to the Appalachian Mountains, from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico. Most are located along rivers and streams which the Native Americans used for provisions. The most modern Native American cultures have been divided into three eras. The Archaic Era, from 8000 BCE, or before the Christian Era, to 1000 BCE. The Woodland Era, from 1000 BCE to 1000 CE, or the Christian Era. And the Mississippian Era, from the years 1000 to 1700. And there is evidence of mound builders in all three eras. 
The mound builders have been attributed to building four basic types of mounds. The most common mounds are the conical mounds. Conical mounds are mounds that are cone or oval shaped. Many of these types of mounds were for burial purposes. Burial mounds ranged in height from 3 feet to 25 feet, and the remains were probably of someone of importance in the society. Conical mounds that weren't burial mounds can have heights up to 70 feet. The second type of mound is the earthen mound or earthen lodge. This type of mound usually had a fire pit in the center and was used for important meetings amongst the chiefs. The Europeans, after their arrival, utilized these mounds by turning them into their military forts, amongst other things. The third type of mounds are effigy mounds. Effigy mounds are mounds that are in the shape of animals, symbols, religious, or human figures. These mounds may have served as territorial markers or enhanced sacred ceremonial ground where people met for major events. Modern Native American shaman or spiritual healers suggest that the effigy mounds enhanced the power for healing and communication with the ancestor spirits. The last type of mound is the platform mound. Platform mounds or temple mounds are flat topped mounds which were used to house temples for the leaders, for ceremonial purposes, sometimes for residences, and sometimes for survival needs such as observing up and down the waterways for unwanted visitors. Welcome back. Even here in Philadelphia, there are remnants of these great and ancient structures. I stand now at the steps of Philadelphia's famous landmark, the Philadelphia Museum of Art. But did you also know that this historic location, which the museum now occupies, was once called Fairmont by the colonial settlers? Up until the time of colonial settlement, this land belonged to the indigenous Americans. And if the mound would have remained undisturbed, it would have been classified as a platform mound today. In 1812, an engine house was built at the bottom of Fairmount to pump water from the Schuylkill River to the top. This lady became known as the Fairmount Waterworks. In 1919, the mound began its most recent transformation into what is now known as the Philadelphia Museum of Art. You're watching Discussions with Indigenous Education. And so, as we go through this presentation, I am going to be showing statements. And uh, this first statement, again, is coming from the Smithsonian Institute's 19th Annual Report of the Bureau of American Ethnology. And um, you're going to see part of the statement now. I will be showing the, uh, the complete statement, really, at the end of the program. I used to end my presentation. I've done this presentation before, and I had this at the end. But I decided that I needed to put it at the beginning because it is something very important for us to have in mind that a considerable portion of the blood of the Southern Negroes is unquestionably Indian. So now again, this is, this is a statement that the United States government, I'm sorry, that the United States government has in their books at the end of the 1800s. Why do we not know this information? Why has this information gradually been eliminated from the history books. And so I think that's what you're going to see. Also, as we go through this, uh, many of the books that you will be seeing were written by people in the 1800s. And again, so the information is there. It's just that as people started rewriting history, they left out some of these things. And so again, these are things that we're going to be learning about. And because of those left out things, uh, this gentleman, uh, and I'm really sorry that these, some of these things are really getting washed out, that uh, this is a, a Alan Gallet, is a, his, he, he writes many historical books on uh, Indian slavery, and he even says, when we consider that so many natives were kept as slaves, sharing the same condition with the vast majority of Africans in America, we must re-examine racialization in early America. They, the native people, people received similar treatment, often were described with similar labels, and frequently were lumped together by law. 
So if all of these things are happening to, to the people, again, why is it, you know, like today, where it is difficult for someone that looks like me to say that they're Indian? Why, you know, why do we have this problem? But again, I think you will see this as we go along in the presentation. So today, we're going to be going over how slavery in America started with the indigenous people who the Europeans named Indians. That Africans and Indians were called Negroes. And so you will see that in, in his, historical books, documents. Africans and Indians were slaves. That many Indian tribes got incorporated into the Negro race. And laws that were created that defined who was a Negro. Now again, I am just going to be touching on many of those things. Because again, if I was to go into detail, uh, each one of those topics, we could probably have a two hour discussion on each one of those, you know. So again, I'll be just touching on, on, uh, on many of these things. Okay, so let's begin. You're watching Discussions with Indigenous Education on Philly Cam. Today's topic, Indian slavery and Africans. Omission, not distortion, is the far more serious culprit in hiding the story of the black Indians of the Americas. That quote by William Lauren Katz from his book entitled Black Indians doesn't even begin to explain the enormity of omission of the dark-skinned indigenous people of the United States. One of the largest omissions is the Native American slave trade and the hundreds of thousands who were enslaved on the mainland were shipped out of the country. Many were shipped well into the 18th century to the West Indies under the guise of punishment, since there were laws in place at that time against Indian slavery. These slaves, once in the West Indies or on the plantations of the South, would blend in with the other people of color being enslaved. So the islands and southern plantations inhabited not only enslaved Africans, but also dark-skinned Native Americans and the descendants of the original Native Americans who got doomed to perpetual slavery. You're watching Discussions with Indigenous Education. My first statement, as you see, is coming from the United States 1890 census. And uh, this is in the back of the census where they record where they recorded the Indian population. So this is in the back. And it says, Diayam persisted in slave hunting about Beaufort, 1520, these Negroes being valuable as laborers. Now, I don't know if, uh, if you recall your United States history, so I'll be going over some of this. First, let me explain who Diayam was. He was a... Um, he was given the rights to be a conquistador or an explorer. Uh, this is before he was given those rights, and we're going to get to that point in, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but again, it says that he persisted in slave hunting about Beaufort, 1520. Now again, this is Beaufort, South Carolina. This is 1520. This is a few years after Ponce de Leon discovered La Florida. So if this is the case, what Negroes are they talking about? Because again, this is 1520. This is like about the second time they've only been here to the Americas. How did they have Negroes here and they're valuable as laborers? Okay, we're, we'll get to that point. <laughs> okay, but it, it began with Ponce de Leon. Again, Ponce de Leon discovered uh, La Florida in about, was, I think it was 1513, where he went on his little expedition. Um, he was a soldier in, uh, in the War of Granada. That it was the last Moorish War of the uh, Spanish Empire. And he was a soldier in that war. He came on Columbus's second trip to, uh, to the Americas. The second trip is when Columbus had paying people who could afford to come on that trip, people that were interested in making money. <laughs> and he was an experienced soldier, and this is what they needed there on the island. Uh, 
So again, as he, as he came to the island, uh, uh, they were going their little expeditions because in their second trip, they realized, you know, we need to get things done. You know, we have crops that we have to grow. We have things that we have to build. We got to live. We have to, you know, they needed all those things and they needed the indigenous people. Um, and they, well, I guess the indigenous people weren't being, some of them were being cooperative, most of them weren't. <laughs> and that's because we had slave raiding expeditions. Okay, uh, Ponce de Leon, he, uh, he started fighting in the little skirmishes around the island so that he can, um, he, he was given, after a few skirmishes, he was given what was called an encomienda. An encomienda is when uh, he would be in charge of maybe a village. And the village, and what he would say is that, okay, you know what, the village, I want all of you, you have to give me a certain amount of crops uh, once a month, and um, uh, I want some of your people to come with me on the expedition to show me where some of these places are, we need your help, and if you do that, uh, we'll provide protection for you. And those, the, and those were their stipulations that they did. Now, who they needed protection from? They only needed protection from the other Europeans. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's not the story that, that we get told. But anyway, they, you know, they have all these, uh, these slaving expeditions. Um, one person then was given permission to even go around to get slaves because they said after a few years, they felt that the island was starting to get depleted of slaves. Uh, they said that they were dying of diseases, but could it be that many of them were leaving the island? They knew where to go. They knew where other places to go. Maybe they were leaving the island. Uh, some of them were probably getting sick. But still, again, we don't know the whole, we don't know the whole story, so we just have to surmise about a lot of things. But with this here, this is in the, it says the text of a capitulation or agreement with the sailor Vicente Yanez Pinzon. This gentleman was on Columbus's first trip. He was really the captain of the Santa Maria. When he was on that first trip, he disappeared from Columbus for quite a number of days. Columbus was really on his way. He was deciding to come back and he had no idea where Pinzon was. Um, and it was right before he was on his way that Pinzon decided he, he came back, they ran into each other, and so then two boats left to come back because one of them got grounded. And, and so only two boats went back after the first trip. So this gentleman was on that first trip, and again, he was missing for several days. I don't, I, it may have been a, couple, a few weeks. What was he doing all that time? Doing reconnaissance, looking around, seeing what he could find. Now, Maybe what he found, he went back to the king of Spain and told the king of Spain. Because then, what does he get? And this is in 1499. He says, the officials issuing this document, and then I'm just read down at the bottom. We also grant you any type of black or dark slaves or other of the ones considered slaves in Spain and for whom there is reason to be slaves. So now, this is in 1499. So again, this is before... This is before Ponce de Leon. But notice, they were, he was given permission for any type of black slave. Now, a lot of times when people are translating those things today, they may trans, translate Negro to African. But you can see that even with this, that you cannot do that because if you translate Negro to African, you're not going to get to the point where it is, this statement here is not talking about Africans. It is talking about black slaves and slaves that are considered slaves in Spain. And remember, he went back, he went on that reconnaissance trip. He went all over the islands and he knew what kind of people that were there. And so he was given permission to come over here to the Americas to get these slaves. Okay, now, uh, I found, and really on that website up there, and that's why I give that also, um, it's from the City University of New York, uh, they gave the Spanish translation. So I said, oh, you know what, being a researcher, I said, oh, let me 
put that translation, let me see what the translation is to see if the person who wrote the book gave us an accurate translation. Because again, these are things that you have to do when you're researching. So I put this in, I put this in Google Translate. Google Translate said, and likewise, at your mercy, in every way, black slaves or parrots, or others of those who in Spain are considered slaves and who by reason should be. So again, they're talking about black people that should be slaves. So again, not Africans, black, but okay, parrots, I'll get to that in just a second, okay? And then I put the translation in one more time. I put it into the, uh, the chat GBT. Has everyone heard about that? Uh, how many of you have been using that? I've been using it. <laughs> it is very convenient. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun, too. You know, you, just, you can't take it word for word, but it is a good reference. It is a very good reference tool. But anyway, I put it in there, and they said, and we also grant you grace in all ways of black slaves, parrots, or others who in Spain are held as slaves and who by reason should be. Okay, so again, we, we're, again, we're getting the essence. So the essence of this message is the same. Again, we still got the term parrots. Where did they get parrots from? Um, I started thinking about that, and, and at first I didn't realize it, but then when I started thinking about it, I said, oh, you know what? I went back and I looked in one of my older books, and I found out that loro is a terminology that the Spanish would use that was talk of speaking about a person that they called an intermediate complexion. Okay, so not all the way black. Maybe like me, okay. But again, I'm still a slave, okay, because in Spain, I'm considered a slave. And the Africans, they're considered a slave. And so again, so when these, when, when, so now when we see that when Spain was giving permission for, and we will read in books, for Africans to be used as slaves, we really have to check the language. I did, I checked the language, and I know that in the one that King Charles gave in, I think, 1513, and then Is Isabella gave one a few years after that, and if, if you read both of them, you can see where there has, the, the, the translation uh, is not necessarily the literal translation, where if you just throw one word off, Again, if we just, trans if we just substitute uh, Negro, where it says Negros, Desclavos Negros, right here, where it says that, if we just say African slaves, like they're doing a lot of times. So, so again, we have to be sure that, uh, that we are using and utilizing the terminologies that they were using back then, that we use that we put them in their proper perspective. Okay, so now, this is Ponce de Leon's. He, now again, that, that one that we just read was from 1499. This is from Ponce de Leon. Uh, and again, uh, each little statement, they, they put item. Uh, I'm gonna read this, it sounds kind of, kind of um, well, you'll see. <laughs> uh, item, that shall command, and by these presents, I do command that the Indians that the Indians who may be in, in the said island may be apportioned according to the persons that there might be, and that rather may he supply himself and may be the first discoverers be supplied than any other persons, and that to these there may be given in it all the advantage that properly should exist. Wow, what a word salad, okay. But uh, again, that was being translated from Spanish. And which is where most of, of the, uh, the, the, the Spanish archives hold most of the, uh, the Spanish history. Those things are still caught up in the Spanish archives. A lot of the information is still there and that's, that would still need to be translated into English even. Okay, but to put this in, in where we can read it a little bit easier, um, Jack Forbes says uh, that of Ponce de Leon, which is the patent, uh, authorizing his voyage of discovery and colonization, provided that the Indians on the islands he might discover should be distributed among the members of the expedition, that the discoverers should be well provided for in the first allotment of slaves, and that they should derive whatever advantage might be secured thereby. So again, we can see that they were definitely utilizing the indigenous people as slaves. And of course, 
This never stopped. This was Ponce de Leon, and so now we're getting back to Diayan. Ponce de Leon was the first conquistador or the first explorer here in, in, on mainland United States. Diayan was the second explorer. Now these explorers, the only way that they could be an explorer is if they could fund the expedition. The Spanish, the, the government did not have the monies. So any of your explorers, uh, first of all, they had to be rich. So they were the elite already, you know, that are coming over here. And, um, and not only were they elite, they were soldiers. All of them were soldiers. Cortez was a soldier. Pizarro was a soldier. Uh, Diayan was a soldier. Hernando de Soto. All, they were all soldiers, okay? And the soldiers, the elite position that they were given was Explorer, that's, that's what they were. And I want to show you a little bit more of this statement because you notice it's a little bit higher than I showed it the last time. It says that these Negroes being valuable as laborers, it says, well, the Indians were useless. Now again, what do they mean by that statement? If this is mainland United States, a few years after the discovery of La Florida, there had been no Africans coming over here any slaves that they did get, where did they get them? They got them from the Caribbean. That, that's, they were right there. They didn't need to bring any over. They had plenty right here that they could use. So again, what did they mean by this statement that these Negroes or these black people that were on mainland United States, that they were valuable as laborers and the Indians were useless? So again, this is propaganda that was added because we know that, how could this statement even be true? Because again, the indigenous people and the Indians, you're talking about the same people here. So, so what happened in our history books then? You know, what happened? Today's topic is a 16th century waterboarding in the Wali chiefdom. The Wali were the indigenous people who resided in what is now coastal Georgia and they were one of the first missionized tribes on what became the mainland United States. On October 7, 1597, Governor Mendez, the governor of Florida, received a letter which stated that there were rumors of six friars having been murdered in Wali territory. Mendez immediately began an investigation into the matter, and within 10 days, the governor himself arrived in Wali territory to investigate. After several months and the destruction of several Wali villages under the instructions of Mendez, the person or persons responsible for the murders still had not been found. In July of 1598, the governor took seven captives, including Lucas, the son of one of the Wali chiefs. Mendez, believing that Lucas was involved in the murders, ordered his torture. Here is that description. Lucas is to be put to the rack, with his feet and hands bound. Two garrotes are to be tightened around each leg, one over the thigh and the other around the calf just below the knee. Four quartillos of water are to be poured into his mouth and nose over a thin piece of cloth placed inside Lucas's mouth. End quote. After the threat of torture, Lucas confessed that he was present when one of the friars was killed. Lucas, however, was found guilty of murder and was hanged, and the other captives were made personal slaves among Spanish officials. Lucas was the only person convicted in the murders of the friars. We would like to thank our sponsors, 